So Audrey Tang is a civic hacker and Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social enterprise. Um, and is, she is known for revitalizing the global um, open source communities such as Perl and Haskell. At the age of eight, Audrey wrote a, a computer game for her four-year-old brother to help her, him uh, learn fractions. And at 14, she dropped out of school to start a search engine company. At 19, she had le left Taiwan to work as an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Uh, she was a consultant with Apple on computational linguistics, with Oxford University Press on crowd lexicography, um, with, and with social text on social interaction design. Uh, now, in her 30s, uh, Audrey is Taiwan's youngest government minister. She is a civic hacker in changing the way that government in Taiwan does business. So we'll see a short uh, video presentation from Audrey, uh, over Skype, and that will be followed by live question session. Unlike many people today, I'm an optimist. The strange condition began when I was 15 years old. That was 1996. I discovered that the future of human knowledge is on the web, and my textbooks are all out of date. So I told my teachers I want to quit school and start my education on the World Web. Surprisingly, the teachers all agreed with it. Then I founded a startup working on web technologies, and I get to join this fabulous internet community that runs with this crazy idea, an anarchistic, no one was in control political system that powers the internet till today. Today, I'm Taiwan's first digital minister. I'm putting into practice the ideas that I learned when I was 15 years old. Rough consensus, civic participation, and radical transparency. Surprisingly, it's working and it's transforming our society. In the spirit of participation, I would like to ask you to enter this website on your phone on the browser, slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O dot com. This website will ask you to enter an event code, and it's the number you see here on the screen, that's today's date. Once you're in, you can ask me anything. And if you see a question from someone else that you also like me to answer, you can like that question. I will answer the questions right after this 10 minutes talk, starting with the questions with the highest number of likes. In 2014, there was a live demo of mass participation. We occupied the parliament for 22 days. At a time, the MPs in Taiwan were refusing to deliberate a trade service agreement with Beijing, and so the occupiers got into the parliament at night and stayed there. For 22 days, we demonstrated how to deliberate a trade service agreement with the whole society. There were over 20 NGOs participating, the Greens, the Labors, the Independents, everybody. We supported this whole deliberation effort with a radically transparent broadcasting, live streaming logistics system, and it was powered by this community called GovZero. GovZero is a civic tech community with a call to fork the government. We take the government websites, which all ends in gov.tw, and make better, open, alternative that ends in g0v.tw. For example, the annual national budget is 100 pages long in a PDF file, and it's very hard to read. The GovZero community's very first project was budget.govzero.tw, which shows the national budget in a way that everybody understands, and you can drill down to each and every budget details. Today, this system is adopted by seven city governments, and it powers the participatory budget platform for the Taipei city at budget.taipei. Anyone can just look at this map, find a part of city budget that they care, and type in any question that they want to ask, and a career public servant actually comes forward and answers for that part of the question. So it becomes a direct dialogue platform, not through the city council, but for the career public servants to communicate with citizens. So why are there so many civic hackers in Taiwan, like me, who spoke to my clients during the Occupy movement, saying, OK, I have to take a three-week leave because democracy needs me? I think it's because, well, I'm 36 now, we're the first generation that enjoyed freedom of speech after three decades of martial law and dictatorship. 
got freedom arrived in 1989, the year of personal computers. So for us, the personal computer revolution and freedom of speech is the same thing. Our first presidential election by popular vote in 1996 is also the year that the World Web got popular. So internet and democracy, they're not two things. It's one and the same thing in Taiwan. And so for the past 30 years, when we see free software, we always think of freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, and never free of cost. We know that freedom is never free of cost. Our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation, paid dearly for it, and we need to use the software freedoms to keep it free, as we did during the Occupy movement in 2014. And the movement caused a revolution, although a peaceful revolution. There was a radical transformation of social expectations at the end of 2014, and many occupiers just found themselves elected mayors when they did not expect it. And because of this, the prime minister resigned, and a new prime minister and engineer said, OK, from now on, crowdsourcing and open data are just going to be the national direction. So the occupiers and the civic tech people who supported them were then invited as mentors, as advisors to the public service to solve issues like Uber. Now, Uber is very interesting because it is a meme, a virus of the mind. The meme was called sharing economy, and it says that algorithms dispatch cars better than laws, and so we don't have to obey laws. The meme spread through apps, from drivers to passengers to drivers. And you can't really argue with the meme, just like you can't argue with the flu. It's not in the same category. And so there's protests. The taxi drivers surrounded the Ministry of Transport and demanding negotiation. But how do we negotiate with the virus of the mind? For us, the solution is through a deliberation that involves thousands of stakeholders. It's a scaling down of the deliberation we just did with half a million people during the Occupy, and so we think we can do it. Deliberation, thinking deeply about something together, is an effective vaccine against the virus of the mind. And when everyone listens to each other and form a consensus, we become immune to divisive PR campaigns in the future. A proper deliberation with the focused conversation method involves four stages. The first stage is facts, where we collect evidences, first-hand experiences, and objective data. And then after that is confirmed, we move to collect everybody's feelings about those same facts. You may feel angry, I may feel happy, it's all okay. And after people converge on their feelings that resonates with everybody, we then talk about ideas. The best ideas are the ones that address the most people's feelings. And then we translate those ideas into legalese and sign them into decisions. However, if the decision-making process is not transparent, people on the street would speak a different language than people in the government. We need mediators, we need facilitators, because otherwise people are not even agreeing on basic facts, let alone each other's feelings. In that situation, ideas become ideologies, virus of the mind that blinds people to new facts and to each other's feelings. And so our first step is open data, that is making all the facts available, not just numbers, but also meeting records, study analysis, and ask the private sector and the civil society to share what they have. Next, we created an interactive survey on polis to ask how people feel about those facts. We send all the stakeholders a polis survey at the same time to ensure a diverse group of participants. Four groups of people soon emerged, taxi drivers, Uber drivers, Uber passengers, and other passengers. And the police system shows each group how well their shared sentiments are received by other groups, encouraging participants to contribute ever more inclusive statements that show up as majority opinions. And the interesting thing is that it lowers people's antagonism, because you can see all these people on different sides are actually your Facebook and Twitter friends, you just didn't talk about this over dinner. So over three weeks of time, people actually converge on the center. At the beginning, the people were on the all the different corners, but because we say we only give binding power of anything that people can propose that can convince a supermajority, that's 80% of people, people compete to bring better ideas that resonate not only with like-minded people, but across the aisle. And after we get a set of feelings that resonates with practically everybody, it's now much easier for the government to meet with all the stakeholders and check with them one by one. Here is the consensus of the people. Do you agree? And if you do agree, how do we translate into law? 
They are bound to the words that they said during the live stream consultation, and so the stakeholders agreed. When we ratified their agreements in August 2016, everybody knew that it was coming, and everyone anticipated it. So today, Uber operates legally under the new framework, but so did the taxi companies, who are now adopting the same model that Uber is using for dispatching its cars. So this method works. Now the next question is: Can we scale this process of listening? Right after the ratification, I joined the cabinet as the digital minister to explore this possibility through PIDIS, the public digital innovation space. We're like policy labs in the UK at a national level. We have designers, programmers, and we're automating away a lot of those chores of the public service. We're bringing radical transparency to the cabinet. By that, I mean all the journalists and lobbyists get to ask me questions, but I only answer publicly. And it's not just to them, but also for internal meetings. For all the hundreds of internal meetings that I had since I was the minister, everything was transcribed and published. The written record was for everyone to edit for ten days, and then we publish it. The effect is very surprising. The bureaucrats actually become very innovative and risk-taking because previously the minister gets credit if things go right, but now with radical transparency. If things go right, they get the credit because their name was on the transcript, and because this is experimental. If things go wrong, it's all my fault. So under this condition, they become innovative and open to a lot of very interesting ideas. One of those ideas is adopting the same technology the free software community is using as our internal communication platform. So we use Etherpad, we use Ethercalc, we use a command board called Weekend, we use Rocket Chat. Previously, the roadblock was on cybersecurity. But we were able to find the Sandstorm.io, a community platform that solves the cybersecurity problems through sandboxing. Our cybersecurity department audits it, and now all the free software that runs on top of it doesn't suffer from the cybersecurity issues. And we have a lot of interesting systems written by young public servants, like an app for ordering lunch together or to plan travels together. And it's really good to have this choice. Also, we had a e-petition platform for people to participate online. It's like the We the People platform in the U.S. It did not receive much attention because for cross-ministry issues, people would just get those very blank, very bureaucratic answers that doesn't really solve their problem, but just explains why they can't do much about it. And after I become the digital minister, we ask each ministry to send a team, at least one person, to serve as participation officers. We assemble this virtual team of 50 people online using Rocket Chat and all those tools for online engagement. So now in Taiwan, when people start a petition, they know that instead of just a dutiful response, they will actually get to meet with all the relevant ministries, either in Taipei or we will travel to those rural areas and islands if they are petitioning for local development. Together, we solve a lot of very interesting problems like this without exposing any public service to risk, and so we relieve their fear, uncertainty, and doubt around civic participation. The idea is that voting and collectivism is very easy. Everybody can do it, but there's not much bits. And through open data, through having interactive Q&A forums, by setting up binding processes, and by bringing the technology to people instead of asking people to use technology, we're building a deliberation system that scales to all levels of the society. And through this, we're building a unified democracy, not hijacked by ideologies. An efficient democracy that responds to the demands of the society, and an empathetic democracy that lets people take care of each other's feelings, and we do this just by listening and building technologies that help us listen to each other. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. So we have what ten minutes for some Q and A. The the top question at the moment is from Kirsten,、uh, saying, "How do you include those without access to technology?"、Um, interestingly, I just came back from one of the most rural areas.、Uh, it's not even in Taiwan; it's in Penghu, a very、um, a remote island、uh, close to Taiwan. And in an even more remote island、uh, in the Penghu area was just at the first marine、uh, national park that was、um, recently introduced for just three years. And there was a dispute、uh, with the local fishes people,、uh, and when people petitioned for a total banning of、uh, fisheries, especially、uh, <coughs> like the uh, uh, drill nets and so on,、uh, and and so we went there. And so to to put a very quick answer to the question, 
we, we do it by bringing the tech to people. We're not asking people to come to the um, websites. If it's just for the internet voting or whatever, of course the, the local fishers people will protest because they don't have the, the same access um, to the internet and they, they're not very used to it anyway. So because of this, we use this huge um, town hall style meeting where people both see the people uh, in the room doing deliberation and also have their own open mic uh, moments. And the whole um, endeavor was 360 recorded so the net effect is that uh, for a local person, you either just walk into a, a nearby town hall or just you use your own phone and on Slido, or you can call your friend and ask them to relay your message and so on. And, and so the, the whole idea is that uh, the local mayors and local representatives see it as an extension of their face-to-face uh, -face deliberation methods and not a replacement. Whenever it's replacement, I think there's a lot of worry, but we're not trying to replace face-to-face -face meetings we're trying to augment it and trying using 360 live streaming and vr to make best use of people's time because people can then enter the previous discussion as if they're there and then uh have a you know five minutes ten minutes experience of what it's like uh to to be diving there to be fishing there and so on before entering the discussion so that they share the some uh common uh, effects so it was pretty successful. Uh, the deliberation yesterday was, I think, the, the most peaceful any uh, similar uh, meetings the, the place has ever seen. Uh, and we actually managed to come up with some consensus. So, so I think that's a, a pretty good sign of what we call a assistive uh, civic technology. It's not uh, trying to replace uh, any existing technology, but just like good assistive tech, they disappear. Um, when people use it and using ambient computing, uh, people just speak naturally and then their consensus is mapped um, automatically uh, into post-it notes. We transcribe everything everybody says and uh, the mind maps and everything uh, into the stakeholder map, the post-it notes and everything. And then so people after walking away from the meeting, they don't just remember one or two sentences, but actually the full uh, map. Of, of what was being discussed, and then this carries on to the next meetings and so on. Uh, the next question is, how do you prevent open government from manipulation by root actors with malicious intent? So the answer is twofold. The first one is, of course, we work on very good cybersecurity measures, sandboxing, active, you know, white hat penetration testing, everything, uh, to make sure the infrastructure itself uh, is safe. I think that's the, the foundation of open government. Now, on the top level, on the content level, we design the space so that you can't reply to anyone. So uh, there's a similarity between Slido and the polis, which you just saw we use in the Uber case, and the petition uh, platform that we use. Um, and they all have the same design in that people are free to voice their concerns and post their ideas, but you can't ever reply to each other. So basically, the best way to counter a argument that you don't agree with is posting a better counter argument and have it upvoted. And so um, throughout these design, it, it doesn't pay to be a troll because you can't really consume other people's attention. And this is the, the idea of, of troll control or troll hugging that we use when we design spaces like this. It's just taking away the replies and, you, and use crowd moderation. Um, what is the most important piece of digital infrastructure that has yet to be developed? Um, we'll notice that uh, for machine learning for AI, we currently use it only for cases where it will be the same, just more time consuming if it's a human doing the same thing. We don't actually use AI for places where, you know, it needs value judgments and so on. Um, but we, I think in order for AI to enter that part, a full development of what we call explainable AI, XAI is essential. It's important that uh, like a good assistant, uh, the the uh, AI doesn't just tell you it's a cat, but actually tells you the, the reasoning behind it. And it's a very new development field. We expect maybe two or three years before we have a good understanding of how explainable AI could work. But I think this is a very important part of digital infrastructure if we are going to automate more of the uh, human in this uh, deliberation process. George would like to know your leapfrogging uh, slow political um, evolutionary change using modern tech? How do you handle people generational gaps? Well, as I explained uh, for the older people, for people who are not used to uh, keyboard and, and mouse, 
actually they're pretty comfortable uh, with a 360 camera. They're pretty comfortable with VR and AR because you know it doesn't require learning a new modality. It's basically just acting naturally and with the room itself acting as a computer. Uh, and so that, that's where our current research mostly lies. We're not really um, focusing on getting people to use more keyboard and more mouse, but rather to use uh, computing devices as a way to connect uh, disparate spaces. But each space is still a communi community space. And I think that that has broad implications uh, even for elders uh, who can't travel, they have to remain home, but they can feel connected through this kind of um, public forums uh, in augmented reality or, or through ambient uh, computing technologies. So that's, that's our current focus. Has your approach to open government found any uptake in other countries? Yes, I, I think um, the New York City, uh, there's a, um, I think, called Civic Hall, uh, it is looking into our methodology and making a documentary and a write-up. Uh, and one of our uh, architects in, in Peters is now in Tokyo and working with um, the people in Japan. And there's also um, like corporations between the Etal Lab in France, um, the people in Madrid. I just virtually visited Barcelona uh, and so on. So there, there's many city-level governments who very much want this thing because their mayors were like, elected on this platform. And there's a, a wider uh, internet community just focusing on this. So we think we're just one of the larger labs. But we, we certainly are very willing to share and include uh, methodology developed elsewhere as well. Where can technologists direct their energies to realize your optimistic future? Well, I, I encourage you to realize your optimistic future is not my optimistic future. Uh, but, but I think what, what helps is, of course, to, to publish uh, in an open source, in a reproducible way, and write good postmortems. Uh, because in, in conferences like this, uh, it's, it's generally not what, what, what the failures or the, the lessons learned were not explored in depth. They're mentioned uh, kind of just part of the narrative. And uh, what I like most, uh, and I try to do myself, is this idea of radical transparency. If something doesn't work, it's as important uh, to document it and learn from it as, as it works, right? So I think it, that's something that I'm also uh, focusing myself, and I would encourage you to also try, is just to try all sorts of different things and fail early and uh, provide write-ups. Do you feel you're a bit better able to influence from within the government than as an activist? Well, well, the funny thing is that I'm still an activist uh, inside the government. I, I don't, uh, as a condition of joining the cabinet, I don't look at any confidential or top secret information. So there's no chance of, you know, ever Snowden in the, the government. So in exchange, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm able to publish everything literally I, I see uh, as, as a freedom of information compatible documents. So I, I'm very much thinking that this works bi-directionally. Uh, I'm both lowering the fear and certainly doubt of public servants when it comes to civic participation. But as an activist, I'm also uh, letting other activists know that there are career public servants who are willing to work this way. They were, you know, muted or something, but I'm kind of their, their voice as well uh, to try to make them um, more visible and also more, more vocal. And when people see career public servants help with their activist agenda, they build rapports. Right. So how do you make sure that crowdsourced solutions and governance doesn't end up harming marginalized communities who don't have the largest numbers? It's easy. We don't vote. Uh, we don't ever vote. Um, the petitions you see, the crowd consensus you see, everything, we don't count the numbers. If there are a hundred people <coughs> having the same um, question, it's just one card on this mind map. It's just one dot on the polis. It's just one sentence on Slido. So all the all the tech that we use, uh, we, we look for diversity. We're not looking for sheer numbers. And it doesn't really work uh, to, to have a crowd that votes exactly the same way. It doesn't influence the process at all. So what we value is a point that is different from everybody else, but can somehow work everybody else's points. Um, how do you balance transparency and privacy? Well, well these two are not at all at odds. I think when people entrust their uh, data in the government to store it, well, it's still their data, right? We're just a data um, controller or a data processor. And, and in that, that case, we will not be, you know, thinking this is transparent. We need to be accountable in how we store and process those private data. But when we publish something under FOIA or under open data, we always do it in a statistical form. 
And I think it's much easier, much better, and especially under a, a GDPR regime um, for the scholarly community to propose uh, algorithms, but for the data owners and controller to run it locally. So instead of publishing private data as data, we need to make sure that there's less uh, or there's no privacy impact before running those statistics algorithms. All right, so they're telling me it's the last question. Uh, is there a danger in this can become a mechanism for pushing a populist agenda? I, I think when, when, when everybody has a, a way to push a populist agenda, this is what democracy means, right? So what, what, what we are trying to do is that we are making everybody a potential uh, agitator, a potential activist, uh, and not just uh, centering it to two or three so-called thought leaders. So like every Friday we process um, a, a petition and everybody takes turns to become a populist leader. And when, once that's uh, demystified, I think there's much more chance of the true democracy developing based on listening to each other. So thank you for listening.